Uh, finally, we turn to Professor Zhang Longxi of the uh, City University of Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Zhang holds a master's in English from Peking University and a PhD in comparative literature from Harvard University. Um, he also, I believe, was a Harvard Yanjing doctoral scholar while he was studying here at uh, Harvard. He is currently the editor-in-chief of the Journal of World Literature, and uh, he's written widely in both Chinese and English. His major English books include uh, The Tao and the Logos, Literary Hermeneutics, East and West, and most recently, uh, a book entitled From Comparison to World Literature. Professor John. Uh, thank you, Professor Perry, for the introduction. Uh, given the uh, very limited time, I just want to make very short remarks, and uh, maybe we can have some time for discussion. Um, <clears throat> I just want to uh, say about three things, uh, because Asian studies, uh, traditionally, I think Asian studies is really outsider looking at Asia from the outside. Uh, includes Sinology, Japanology, Koreanology, and so on, uh, or Indology. So it's not really Asian, uh, um, Asian scholars studying their own uh, tradition, but rather um, particularly European and American uh, scholars uh, study Asia. So in that sense, Asian studies, um, by writing actually, uh, if you look at the Journal of Asian Studies, is published in English, or many of the uh, important uh, journals in uh, Asian studies or Oriental studies uh, using English or French as the language of publication. So in that sense, Asian studies by nature is looking from outside uh, into Asia. But of course, uh, just like uh, Professor uh, Hirano just mentioned earlier, now there are so much border crossing. Uh, there are so many Asian study, uh, scholars also come to the West and study and also contribute to Asian studies. So nowadays, it's very difficult to say it's completely outsider looking at the in or insider looking from outside. So as a comparative myself, I always think that uh, I'm, I, I don't really, I cannot really claim to be an insider or outsider. Um, but that's what I enjoy actually in between this is precisely where the comparative should be. Um, so Asian studies, because of this um, ori origin uh, in, in the West, and there is a tradition basically, uh, I think, of looking at Asia from outside and therefore emphasize the difference between Asia and Europe. I mean, the emphasis on difference, the cultural difference between different civilizations is indeed the major trend, um, or, uh, predominant tendency in Asian studies. I remember in 1991, the Journal of Asian Studies was uh, the editor, um, 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 what's his name, uh, <laughs> Baker. Um, he um, he uh, had a special issue, uh, a forum on relativ uh, universalism and relativism. Basically, universalism is a view that uh, uh, different civilizations share certain commonality and the, it's universal. Uh, but relativist view is really questioning whether there is any conceptual tools available to study different civilizations across uh, uh, regions and across borders and so on. And he said uh, the related view, the skeptic view of this commonality and, and possibility of studying Asia using a conceptual um, uh, tool that is uh, inter interculturally, sub uh, intersubjectively valid uh, is very much in doubt. And that is the predominant view by most of, uh, among most Asian scholars. And said, indeed, uh, in the Journal of Asian Studies, most of the papers published are emphasizing on the East-West divide. Um, if you look at the uh, traditional sinology, uh, certainly in 19th century, in France in particular, I mean, um, uh, um, Jonathan Spence once he said there is a French tendency of what he called the French exotic. That is, the French scholars in particular look at Asia always looking at something that is very different and, and looking at the very attraction of the study of Asia is because it is exotic. And of course, this has an intellectual tradition. If you think of uh, Levi Bruce, uh, Levi Bruce's uh, 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 idea of mentality, you know, every nation, every culture has a different mentality and, uh, and embedding a different language. Uh, 
uh, and you, you find a sinologist, very important, uh, Marcel Granet wrote this book called Pensée Chinoise, basically using the same idea to discuss Chinese culture and Chinese thinking. And of, uh, in, 18th, uh, in 20th century, uh, uh, Jacques Genet, his book on Christianity in China, why Christianity failed in China, because Chinese couldn't possibly understand what Christianity is, because uh, the Chinese didn't really have abstract thinking, couldn't really understood what is the spiritual truth of Christianity, all this, and trying to, uh, to talk on a level of language and philosophy and always push to this uh, fundamental difference and in, uh, in incommensurability. And if you look at the 20th century, very important social science and humanities influential uh, um, concepts. Of course, Thomas Kuhn's idea of paradigm as uh, incommensurate is very, very influential in social studies and uh, humanities. So that is the the basic problem, I think Asian studies, if you think of Asian studies is really study of Asia, largely in writing in English or French or other uh, European languages, it's really by nature comparative. This is uh, part of my argument in my keynote speech this year in Toronto, because um, writing about Asia in a Western language is by nature comparative. But I do not believe that writing in English or French uh, would make you become an uh, English thinker or French thinker. I mean, I don't believe the uh, Sapir Wolf thesis that the language you speak will determine uh, what you think. By the sheer fact that uh, the, the speakers of the same language have very different views. You know, you all speak English, but in America you have different schools, and different scholars, very different schools. Uh, the same is true of Chinese speakers. Sometimes I find myself agree with some foreign scholars more than <laughs> with fellow Chinese scholars. And so it's, the difference is everywhere. It's not just between languages and cultures, but also among languages and cultures. So you find diversity and difference everywhere, not just across the geographical or linguistic or ethnic boundaries. So I think the important uh, concept, uh, again, uh, Professor Hirano just mentioned the border crossing. It's very important. I mean, Asian studies, um, if you think of this east-west divide, uh, nowadays, in particular, there is a tendency, we also, I also argue that uh, Asian studies is not just uh, a pure sort of academic discipline study. It is scholarship, but at the same time, it's always related to the world we live in, which also in many uh, important ways define how we do our scholarship. And I think uh, for Asian studies, I think with the change of the world, in particular uh, uh, the last few decades in the 20th century, and now into the 21st century, I would say now we have a much better condition to do Asian studies because Asia becomes more and more important. The rise uh, of China and India in economic and political power, and certainly that is uh, making the world pay more attention to Asia. Asia could, didn't matter when, when you know, in, uh, uh, 30 years ago or you know, 50 years ago uh, in, in the West can look at Asia, for example, nobody would read a Chinese scholar's book to learn China, uh, to learn about China. And you, what you need in Asian studies is to read other sinologists rather than read any native scholarship. But nowadays, I think it's very important to have the, the really um, uh, break up this boundary between the insider and outsider, as I mentioned earlier. I don't know whether I consider, consider myself as insider or outsider, because I uh, got my PhD at Harvard, I taught in California for 10 years, and I'm now in Hong Kong in 20 years. But I originate from China. I, I study Chinese uh, classics by myself, and I read in Chinese classics. So whether I consider myself an insider of China or outsider. So I think this is a, a silly question. Actually, we don't should, we should not consider this. Border crossing is important. Uh, what is good scholarship is good scholarship. It doesn't matter if it is written in English or, or, or Chinese or whatever language. Um, so I think that's one thing I want to emphasize, particularly in, in, the, uh, in the world we are now living in. I think we should not emphasize the east-west divide. We should build bridges rather than walls. You know, people are talking about building walls along the borders. I think that's silly. It's not realistic. And also, <laughs> intellectually, it doesn't make sense. I mean, Asian studies or any scholarship is precisely uh, about you know, breaking down the walls. You know, China has a great wall, but it didn't 
prevent uh, in the Mongols came from the north <laughs> and conquered China. Um, and the, uh, the, the war, of course, many people question whether Marco Polo did go to China. There's a famous book by Francis Wood. Her imp implied answer is no, because the book didn't talk about Great War. But Great War today we see is built by Ming Dynasty, you know, in the Ming Dynasty, the three year, 300 years after Marco Polo. Uh, so, so I think you know, wars never worked, uh, physically or, or metaphorically. Um, I think, it's, therefore, it's more important today to emphasize the bridging, the crossing of borders and making bonds with other people, other civilizations, rather than to retreat from uh, in a sort of, you know, uh, populism, nationalism. I think that's a very dangerous tendency. Um, the, uh, this is the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that actually in China, in I, I believe this is true of, of uh, Japan and Korea, the best scholars of their own traditions realize that nowadays, uh, particularly 20, 21st century, you cannot just study your own civilization in isolation. You have to study the civilization at least in a region in East Asia. For example, uh, in Taiwan University, uh, uh, a group of people have, uh, particularly led by Professor Huang Junjie in Taiwan University, has this study of Confucianism uh, in the East Asian uh, framework, rather than just traditionally look at the commentators in China. But now they also look at Japanese commentators, Korean commentators, and all this uh, uh, study of Confucianism. I had a very, very, uh, very different view and very interesting uh, uh, insights getting from a different perspective. In Fudan University, uh, Guo Zhaoguang, uh, uh, a very good uh, Chinese scholar, also uh, proposed to study China from the border regions, to look at China, again, not just within China, but also from Jap Japanese and Korean and Vietnamese perspectives, and because there are many, many material available. Traditionally, Chinese scholars would only read Chinese scholars, but now I think important is to look at this in a larger perspective. And again, it's emphasizing the comparative methodology. I think nowadays the best scholar, what, what is the best scholar? A best scholar is a scholar who knows his or her own field so well, he also knows the limitations, and therefore to push boundary to beyond that boundary is the way to go for newer, newer insights in scholarship. Therefore, I think uh, even for the study of tradition, uh, traditional Chinese or traditional Korean or Japanese uh, cultures um, has reached to the point that a bigger uh, region, uh, uh, enlarged uh, um, and the horizon, a, a, a different, more broad, uh, you know, broader perspective uh, is important, uh, methodologically uh, important uh, uh, concept to push for. Um, <clears throat> the third point I want to uh, talk about very briefly is what has already been mentioned, uh, Asian studies uh, or study of their traditions in China in particular. For example, Guoxue, the national learning. National learning has been controversial for many years uh, because it's not very, uh, very well defined. And uh, not just the, the definition of this uh, concept, but really the purpose of doing uh, guoxue. Uh, nowadays, I think in China, maybe it's very healthy. That it's very, very different. Uh, many different people, different scholars have different views on any issue. There's debates and different um, uh, um, critical perspective. I think that's very healthy, maybe. Um, and about uh, the study of tradition, study of uh, Chinese tradition or guoxue, national learning, uh, sometimes it's, it's simplified to Confucianism and a certain, uh, certain way of looking at Confucianism. It's really, if you look at Confucianism, if you read, uh, if you read uh, Lun Yu, for example, the Confucian analects, uh, what the people are talking about in guoxue is very, very different from what traditionally um, understood of uh, original Confucian thinking, or even the different tradition. Of course, Confucian, uh, Confucianism has been uh, a very complicated phenomenon in China because it has long tradition. But Chinese civilization is not just Confucianism. Traditionally, we call three teachings. It's also Taoism and Buddhism are also very important. But Guoxue tend to be heavily on the Confucian side. Um, so that's a, a, a limitation. And another more serious limitation, I think, is this narrow-minded nationalistic tendency in the study of national tradition. It's really for uh, not just the softer power, you know. It's really a boost of national pride. I think that is not very helpful. 
uh, this kind of uh, tendency is also existent. And uh, in recent time, you can uh, uh, think some people have talked about Confucianism, almost turning it into a national religion. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that it will be very, uh, ever be successful. China's, uh, if there's anything that is really different from China from the West is that China never has a religion, or never has religion as the priority uh, uh, on top of uh, priorities. Um, but some people were, ask, uh, were, were trying to push for Confucianism almost as a religion or a, you know, a predominant uh, uh, ideology. I think that is, uh, uh, that is a very dangerous, unhelpful uh, tendency. So there is also this compli complication of the study of tradition. Uh, of course, it's understandable China is now getting more and more developed and economically and, and politically, and therefore culturally also is important. Um, So it's important to have this, uh, uh, to understand the, the, the rise of Guo Xue, but at the same time, uh, there's both positive side and negative side. The positive side is that some scholars really uh, have done very good studies of Zhu Xi, for example, uh, Song Dynasty, Confucian, and uh, much more scholarship in, indeed in the, tradition, in the study of traditional uh, culture. Uh, but on the other hand, there is this uh, very difficult to differentiate, but we have to make the differentiation between the purely scholarly uh, research and for the understanding of tradition and the sort of nationalistic use, usage of Guo Xue or national learning uh, as a tool to sort of boost national pride and, and that is, tendence, and that is a not very good tendency. Um, so finally, I, let me just conclude uh, the three points I have mentioned. That is, I think it's very, very important for Asian studies uh, not just a uh, Western view of China or Japan or Korea or Asia in general, uh, nor should be uh, the, the, the differentiation of the uh, scholarship as Asian studies as a Western uh, discipline and a native scholarship in China and Japan, Korea. So I think now it's really the time to break up this kind of di dichotomy and actually, uh, once I used Sun Po's famous poem on Lu San to argue that, uh, you know, Lu San is a very famous poem. The first line says that if Lu San, if you look from the side or from far or from near, there are all different views. But of course, the two last lines are most famous. We don't know the true face of Lu, Mount Lu because we are all inside. It seems to imply that if you get outside, you can have the view. This is not what Sun Po is saying because in the first two lines, he already says, you know, Lu San is different from a different point of view. So I think there's n no, you know, insider's view is better or outsider's view is better, but to understand Asia in general should be the integration of different scholarship from both the outside and the inside. So finally, I would say, you know, crossing the borders and really uh, abolish all these different uh, artificial differentiation boundaries is a way for Asian studies to study, uh, to, to develop in the future. Thank you. <laughs>